Hi everyone, it's so nice to be here again and to minister to you. And I've really had a, a pleasant and wonderful time preparing this message, but it's not the kind of message that's easily communicated. So bear with me. I hope and pray that you took up my uh, your challenge, you might say, uh, my warning for wanting to read all of uh, Genesis 24. And, uh, and I hope and pray that you did it because it'll serve you well, because I'm not going to read the entire chapter, uh, but I am going to go through a good portion of the chapter for us today. So let's begin with our introduction, but first prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you, Father, for your word. We just thank you, Father, that there are lessons for us to learn about Abraham's life, even his servant's life, as we'll see. Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate our minds, our thoughts, Lord, we pray that we will see our responsibility as your servants to, to bring the message of salvation to the dying world around us. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, I was going to say, and I'm going to say, no picture or any type of Christ is perfect okay, for the Old Testament. And God uses earthly stories and people to illustrate heavenly truth. And the very fact that the characters of flesh and, and the incidences take place in this world is enough to make them imperfect illustrations. In this story of Abraham's servant, uh, who is seeking a bride for Isaac, that's Abraham's son, uh, Abraham represents the Heavenly Father, Isaac represents the Lord Jesus, the servant represents you and me and the servants of the gospel who are instruments of the Holy Spirit. And Rebecca, she represents every true believer. Okay, Again, that's us. <laughs> but God gave a very big time promise to Abraham uh, that he would be the father of many nations. We see this in Genesis chapter 17. You don't have to turn to these various references I'm going to give for the sake of time. But in Genesis chapter 17, the first two verses, it says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him, saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will set up my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. We also know that if God's promise is to be fulfilled, he needed to, uh, he needed, uh, for, as a father, to have a son through his wife Sarah, okay? And so it happened. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 16, it reads, God told Abraham, I'm putting that in there, I will bless her, that is Sarah. Indeed, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Keep that in mind later on, that promise. I will bless her. She will produce nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Interesting. In Genesis chapter 21, it reads in verses, the first three verses, the Lord came to Sarah as he said, uh, he spoke to, to Abraham already, now he's speaking to Sarah. Okay, and he said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant. She bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the point, at the appointed time God had told him. Abraham named his son who was born to him, the one Sarah born to him, Isaac. Okay, Now, let's take up the various points of this message. Abraham trusted, his Abraham's trusted servant is commissioned and he's sent. Okay, Abraham's trusted servant is commissioned and sent uh, to do the work of his master, Abraham. Now, if God's promise is to be fully realized, a great miracle needed to happen. Here we have Abraham, Sarah, and their grown son Isaac. He's now grown, and no grandchildren. He doesn't have a wife, okay? Abraham was a, a prophet of God. He would send his servant to find a bride for his son Isaac, but not for just any, not just any woman, okay? This bride would be special. She would share with Isaac all of the riches and glories of the future kingdom. And so it begins. In Genesis 24, verse 2, all the way up to verse, the first part of verse 4 reads, Abraham said to his servant, the elder of his household, who managed all he owned, place your hand under my thigh. It's like a handshake. And I will have you swear by the Lord, 
God of heaven and God of earth, that you will not take a wife of my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But go to my land, my ancestral land, and my family to take a wife for my son Isaac. Okay. Now let's pause briefly for uh, a closer look at this picture. The similarities between Isaac and Jesus are striking. Okay, the, picture, the scriptures tell us that the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is the heir of all things. He inherits all things. The Father has given all things into his Son's hands. We see that in John chapter 3, verse 35, where it reads, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hands. So Jesus is Lord and King by design, God's design, by decree, and even by his death. In John chapter 17, uh, verse 2, it reads, since you, have, since you gave him authority over all people, so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. Another reference that you can look up in your own time is Romans 14, 9. So God has chosen out of every tribe, kindred, and nation, a people to be the bride of his son Jesus and joint heirs with him of all that he purchased and owns. Okay, So Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 lets us in on this. It says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless in love before him. Okay? So the father calls and sends his servants, preachers of the gospel, out into the world to find a bride for his son Jesus. Okay? In Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, it reads, Then he said to them, just as Jesus speaking, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. Okay? That's, it's a big commission that we have as God's servants to go out there and do exactly as God has said. Okay? This isn't just a function of missionaries or pastors and preachers. This is a function for every single believer who knows the Lord Jesus Christ, who God has given a mouth or a pen, whatever it may be that he needs uh, to get the word out. Next point I want to look at is that uh, Abraham's servant, like all of us, needs assurance, okay? So the servant is, has this mission, and, but he has a big question, okay? Look at verse 5 in chapter 24 of Genesis. It reads, Suppose the woman is unwilling to follow me to this land. Should I have your son go back to the land you came from? In other words, should I let him stay there? Okay? And Abraham warned the servant, stay on the mission. Okay, his mission required faith in God. He says in verse 6, Make sure that you don't take my son back there. Okay, and the next thing he said to his servant was about faith. In verses 7 and 8 it reads, The Lord, the God of heavens, this is Abraham speaking, who took me from my father's house and from my native land who spoke to me and swore to me, I will give this land to your offspring, he will send his angel before you, and you could take a wife of my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to follow you, then you are free from this oath to me. But don't let my son go back there. Okay. Now, Abraham does not know all the details of what God is going to do. As I said, we're dealing with imperfect people, imperfect, uh, you know, they're flesh and blood like ourselves, okay? But Abraham does not know all the details of what God is going to do. But his servant must know that the choice of the woman is God's. It's very evident in our text here. We'll see that more. Abraham assured the servant that he was not going on his own, but that the Lord God, who made Isaac the heir, would go with him and reward his efforts. God has promised that in verse 7, verse the latter part of verse 7, he will send his angel before you, and you could take a wife for my son from there. Well, that's amazing. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus says in John 14, verse 16 to his disciples, I will ask the Father, 
and he will give you another comforter to be with you forever. Okay, that's amazing language as well. So here we now moving on to the servant's faith. Uh, whether this is uh, the servant who is from the masses or not, I do not know at this point. But anyway, let's consider his faith. Because this servant had faith. Not only did Abraham have faith, not only did Sarah have faith, but faith was required of this servant in order for him to fulfill his mission. In other words, he's circumcised. He's one of uh, the males of Abraham's household. But I also believe that he has a circumcised heart. He's not just a Jew outwardly, okay? Uh, it was never according to the flesh. So what happens next is very interesting. It demonstrates that the servant believed and trusted in his master's word, that is Abraham's word, and who he knew was speaking on behalf of God. He was speaking prophetically. In verse 9 it says, So the servant placed his hand under the master's thigh and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Okay, Abraham provided all that a servant would need for his mission. In verse 10 it reads, the servant took 10 of his master's camels and with all kinds of his master's good in hand. We'll see some of that later on. Now, we will see the faith of the servant in action. Look at verse 11. It says, that evening, the time when woman came out to draw water, he made the camels kneel beside a well outside the town. By the way, this is the town that Abraham sent them to. And so he's there, he's there at this well, and he's the woman coming out to draw water, at least that particular time. And we think of, uh, who is it there? Jesus at the woman at the well, speaking to the Samaritan woman, okay? Who is, you know, whatever, we can go into that at the time. But anyway, note how we sought God's guidance through the details. He's, he's like us, he's human like us, okay? Uh, this was his prayer, okay? Verse 12, it reads, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make this happen for me today and show kindness to my master Abraham. He's not looking for God to show kindness to him because he made an oath. He's looking for God's, you know, the master Abraham, that his word will be fulfilled. But of course we know it's God's intention and God's purpose. So he's talking to God while standing on his two feet. A lot of people think you need to pray, you got to be on your knees, you got to be sitting someplace, whatever. He's on his two feet and he's talking to God, he's by a well, okay? And he prayed, make this happen happen to me today. Well, that's kind of anxious, okay? Uh, I don't know if I'd ever pray like that, God, make it happen today. I know some of you is perhaps uh, driving into a parking lot, the Moles Market Basket, Shaw's or whatever, and you're looking for a pocket space, you say, Lord, I need a pocket space now. And you see one and you attribute that to God. Be very careful there. <laughs> and you don't say, give me a pocket space today. Okay, you just want a parking space, okay? So we gotta be careful what we pray for. Uh, he knew his mission. He knew what was, what was said to him by Abraham. Uh, and he's trusting in the word that Abraham gave him. Now, he says, okay, he's talking to God while standing on his two feet. He's telling God of his situation as if God didn't know, okay? In verse 13, it reads, I am standing here at the spring where the daughters of the men of the town are coming out to draw water, okay? Now, the servant needs answer to prayer. <laughs> for this is all to work together for God's glory. The servant needs answer to prayer. Now, here's his most important question, in my mind at least. He needs to know how the woman that God has elected for Isaac will stand out from all of the other women. Okay? And in verse 14, it says, he says in his prayer, Let the girl to whom I say, please lower your water jug so that I may drink. And who responds, drink, and I'll water your camels also. Let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. I mean, that's quite the prayer. <laughs> Not only does he want to know, you know, whether she has a flower in her bonnet or whatever, he wants her to really demonstrate that, you know, she's going to get water for him, which is, you know, a, a, any woman may do that if she's kind, respectful, okay? But he wants her also to water his animals, 
Okay, that's amazing. That's that's really pushing it, I think. But you know what? God honored it. We'll see. As soon as he fin as he's finished talking to God, as soon as he's done praying, this is what happened. In verse 15, it reads, There was Rebecca. I love it. I love the way it says it. There was Rebecca. Okay. Daughter of Bethuel of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor coming with a jug on her shoulder, okay, here she comes, okay, <laughs> and, you know, immediately, immediately, you know, after the brief conversation with her, he gave her gifts, okay, and it says in verse 47, it says, so I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrist, now this is amazing, he put a ring on her nose, I, I don't think that's like putting a ring on a finger, engagement finger, I, I don't, I don't think there's anything like that at all, but nonetheless, you know, the nose is a sensitive and intimate place. <laughs> and putting a ring on her nose, that's amazing. But it had to be a pretty, pretty good ring. Now, that's their idea of beauty. Not quite mine, but that's okay. Anyway, so uh, immediately so, the, the, the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrist, those represent gifts, okay? Uh, uh, where he's basically giving her gifts which are so important to her, Okay to ha affirm her, you might say. And it was so, this was true also when you believed in Jesus. In Ephesians chapter, chapter one, verse 14, it reads, the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. So she's receiving a down payment of her sorts in that time and day. Now, everything the servant prayed for was fulfilled to the smallest detail. Here's his immediate response. Now, I love this. This is this speaks volumes to me. When If you're a soul winner and you know what it's like to pray for someone's salvation, but you really don't know who that someone is, and you're praying that God would provide them, you might say, with the question or the action that will lead to a deeper conversation about God, about salvation. Uh, so he, he's had all of these details of his prayer fulfilled, okay? And here's his immediate response. It wasn't a day later, wasn't a week later, wasn't when he was at the church service. In Genesis chapter 24, in verses 26 and 27 it reads, Then, don't forget he was standing up when he prayed. He's probably standing when he meets this girl, okay, Rebecca. It says, Then the man knelt down. Then the man knelt down and worshipped the Lord. And this is what he said. Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not withheld his kindness and faithfulness for my master. Wow. As for me, the Lord has led me on the journey to the house of my master's relatives. It's all fulfilled. So question. What is your response when someone you shared God's plan uh, and they have believed it, you know, when you shared them the good news of Jesus Christ? What is your response? Um, this is something that we should really uh, consider. Do we, do we, as I said earlier, do we immediately, uh, are we immediately astonished that God is doing a work which is outside of us, which is beyond us, which we're not capable of doing. We can only we can only follow the commands and instructions that God has given us, or as the servant has received from his master Abraham. But to turn the heart, turn the heart of a Rebecca, to turn the heart of a Karen, to turn the heart of a Janet, to turn the heart of a, a Deb, to turn the heart of a David, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. And that kind of response is of God, is of God. Anyway, uh, Jesus says, hey, well, anyway, let me go a little bit further here. The servant is a picture of Jesus' disciples. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, that this is for you. Okay, Abraham's servant is a picture of every Christian who knows that he or she has been commissioned by God to bring the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ to every tribe, nation, and tongue. God's servants do not go forth alone into the world to persuade men to believe, love, and come to Christ. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says, as he gives a commission to his church, 
Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them, instructing them, to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am always with, I am with you always. I am with you always to the end of the age. So we don't go along alone when we share the gospel. Uh, we're not doing it out of the power of our own flesh. We can't make people get saved. Uh, God has to go with us when we evangelize. God has to be uh, with us when we preach. God has to be with us when we teach. God has to be with us when we're instructing our children. God has to be with us in a Sunday school class. God has to be with us in vacation Bible school. If God is not with us, all our efforts in vain. They're all in vain. So the Spirit of God goes before his servants to give spiritual birth, to give ears to hear and eyes to see. Uh, ears to hear and eyes to see what? The beauties of Jesus Christ. Eyes to see, ears to hear, to behold the beauties of Jesus Christ. And a heart to love him who they have never known in the flesh. That's right, they have never known Jesus in the flesh. Not today. Back in the day of Jesus, when he walked the face of the earth, they met him, they talked with him, they had a meal with him, they conversed with him, they slept in the same room maybe, okay? But we don't have that. We, you know, we live in a different time. We're 2,000 plus years removed from that event, okay? And But you remember what Jesus said to Thomas? Don't forget Thomas. He doubted the Lord and he once says, I want, unless I touch his wounds, I'm not going to believe. But anyway, uh, God basically, Jesus called, you might say, Thomas to his attention when he appeared. And, and he says this to Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Because you've seen me believe. Here it comes. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now here's Rebecca. Okay, here's Rebecca. She's never seen the face of Isaac. She's never seen the face of Isaac's father. But she believes. And she's attracted to the message about him. Okay. God grabbed her heart. <clears throat> okay. Now, at this point, it's worth mention, mentioning that the servant is not the focus of the mission. Okay. He's not the groom. He's not the groom to be. His mission is primarily, and really seriously only, to fulfill his master's commission, commission which is Abraham's commission, to bring home a bride for Isaac, his son. <clears throat> okay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Paul says, we are not proclaiming ourselves, we're not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So we're going out not only as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are there to serve God's saints, those people that he's calling to be his saints, those that he's calling through his gospel to come to Jesus, okay? That's our job. That's our job as his disciples. It's nothing fancy. I think we make too much of passes today. We make too much of uh, uh, creative people. Uh, I think that the most wonderful and the most powerful uh, person with God is the one that God has entrusted his gospel to, the one that believes God, the one that has faith that God will answer his prayers. The one that, uh, you know, he doesn't know who's going to get saved. He doesn't know uh, who is or who is not going to be saved. But he does go out there, as Jesus commanded, to preach the gospel. Why? Because he knows it's through the means of preaching the gospel, by going and looking for them, okay, that God will call his elect, that God will find his elect bride. Okay, now here's a word of comfort, okay. Um, Paul, when he wrote, okay, before I get to the word of comfort, Paul says, you know, uh, the bride has been chosen as such. She is the object of God's grace. And he said, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10, he says, I endure all things for the elect. So he is a servant, Abraham's servant. He's going out like Paul, and he, you know, he's, he's, he's trying to fulfill his commission, okay? 
And like Paul, he's, he's going through whatever is necessary uh, to bring the word to the people who are going to hear it. He says, I endured all things for the elect. Why? So that they may also obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. As I, here I, I was going a little earlier here. Now here's a word of comfort to those who God sends out into the world. In John chapter 6, verse 37, it says, Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. Now, God, through Abraham, sent the servant to fetch a wife for his son Isaac, for Abraham's son Isaac. He didn't go there for just any woman. God sent his servant for one woman. And even though the servant never laid eyes on her until that first moment, he didn't know who she was. He didn't know specifically who she was. And yet he went and he trusted God. Everyone the Father gives will come. And as we'll see, Rebecca will go. Okay? So the servant must secure the bride for his master's son. Okay, in verses 32 through all the way up to verse 51, again, I'm not reading it. We see that the servant was welcomed into Rebecca's household, her home, uh, the home of her mother, her brother Laban. We'll talk about him later on in Genesis, perhaps. But he would, not, he would not partake of their comforts until he had accomplished his mission and declared his message, okay? And he declared to Rebe Rebecca and her kindred the glories of Isaac and his master's house, Abraham's house. As God's servants, we have one message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, let's consider the blessing of a faithful servant. Finally, after the servant informed Rebecca's mother and brother Laban of the purpose of his mission, they spoke to Rebecca. Hey, this is a big deal. I don't know about you, but you know I had two daughters, and uh, some of you have daughters as well. And when, when young men come courting, you wonder who they are, what they are, and all that kind of thing. What are they really after? You know, you wonder about their motivations and whatever. But they're probably really on board. But they want to know. They want to be sure that Rebecca is also on board. Okay. So they called Rebecca and they said to her, will you go with this man? Will you go with this man? This evangelist, this preacher of the gospel, will you go with him to have a husband? Will you go with this man? And what was her reply? Three words, I will go. I will go. You know, it, it reminds me when, when a man says, will you marry me? And the girl says, I will. It's the economy of words. She only uses two words. Rebecca used three. I will go. Wow. That's the same thing, isn't it? There is her in play here. She has God-given faith. And now it's a plain sight for all to behold. Okay? She has faith in this message the servant has brought. Okay? She's comforted in knowing okay, that she's going to be in safe hands. And, and the family is assured by her willingness to go that this is okay. And why do I say that? Because I think they're believers. But that's besides the point. I can't say for sure. Anyway. This is her, her faith in it's in plain sight. She believes the word of the servant. And of course, it's the word of his master, Abraham. She believes God has prepared for her a husband. I love that. <laughs> when you got saved, when someone brought you the gospel, did you ever imagine that God was preparing you for a husband? You didn't think about that, did you? Remember that next time you witness. Next time you evangelize. So she believes God is prepared for her husband. And she puts her trust in the servant 
to lead her to Isaac's dwelling. Now, one of the things we see about Paul's letters sometimes, and some of the letters, uh, he loses the trust and the confidence of the people to whom he witnessed and shared and established their churches even. And he has to reassert himself. Hey, I'm the guy that brought you the gospel. You saw the power of the gospel at work in power of God at work in me with you. You're the evidence, okay? You're the evidence that, you know, I'm the real thing. And, uh, <laughs> And yet it's so difficult, it's so difficult to, to be trusting somebody enough to go on a journey with them that you have no idea where it's going to take you. It's all words and nothing but words so far. But knowing the true God and Jesus Christ is a personal experience as God is pleased to reveal himself to an individual. Faith in Christ, salvation in Christ, and a saving interest in the Lord Jesus Christ is an individual, personal, and total commitment. Well, Psalm 9 has something for us here in the first, first two verses. The psalmist writes, I believe it's David, I will thank the Lord with all my heart. I will declare all your wondrous works. I will rejoice and boast about you, and I will sing about your name, Most High God, Most High. I think on a journey back to Massa Abraham's house, she's there wondering what this is all about other than the details she was already given, but she hasn't really totally gone beyond apprehending the thought and a promise she needs to actually apprehend, okay? But this servant, he's tickled pink. <laughs> he is, he's beside himself. Why is he beside himself? Because he saw the work of God in creation, new creation. He saw it and he's blinded by it. That's all he sees, that God was with him. The father, uh, the God and father of Abraham spiritually, okay? Our Heavenly Father is not only with Abraham, he's not only with Isaac, but he's with him. It's, you could say the same, he's with me. What a precious thing. The God of creation is with you if you be in Christ. Sing about that. Will you boast in that? Now, here's the blessing of Rebecca's family as they sent her off. Yeah, there's a blessing there. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 60, it says, the family, they blessed Rebecca, saying to her, Our sister, may you become thousands upon ten thousands. May your offspring possess the city gates of their enemies. Wow, this sounds a lot like what I said earlier about jotting it down about Sarah, that she would be this woman who kings and princes would come from. Wow, nations, tribes, peoples. Wow, a number that you cannot number as the stars of the heavens and the sands of the sea. They were, they were really blessing her. Okay. The Apostle Paul, as we know, one of God's servants, has said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealous, jealousy because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present you a pure virgin to Christ. Now, if that's Paul's ambition, we who share Christ should embrace that same ambition for ourselves. That when we bring people to Christ, when we bring our children to Christ, when we bring our neighbor to Christ, a fellow worker to Christ, okay? Someone that calls us up out of the blue, <laughs> when we bring them to Christ, okay? Will we end up with a godly jealousy because you've promised them in marriage to one husband to present them as a pure virgin to Christ? Well, that's amazing. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. We'll close with this verse. He says, and everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or feels like Rebecca 
everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children in the same manner as Rebecca, because of my name, they will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. Isn't it God good? What a what an account this is. I preached this somewhat of the same message on Trinidad at least once. I think I probably perhaps preached it here with our church family some years ago, not that recent. And I'm always blown away by it because as as someone that you might say who loves sharing the gospel with others and you know even have the vision for the ministry as I have uh, globally even I'm just awfully amazingly excuse me amazingly blessed to know that in all that God has done with you with me uh, with those that we have brought the word if they have heard this word and if they have believed this word and embraced Jesus as their Savior, I'm, I'm just tickled pink about that. I'm just, I just, we, you should delight about that. I should delight about that. But he is a danger in the life of a church like ours, or any church for that matter. It's not the pastor who brings in the lost sheep. He may. It's your responsibility to bring the gospel, to bring her, the bride, to meet her husband. It's your responsibility. Whether it be Sunday school, Bible study, but more than that, as an evangelist, we are all called to be evangelists with a small e, at the very least. Soul in us. Why? Because the charge that Jesus gave his disciples about the Great Commission is applicable to ourselves as well, no less. So, with that, I conclude this message and would ask one of you out there to um, pray. Thank you.